My name is Maria Martiniello. I am the Director of Sales, Marketing and Communications for your BBB. And I'm here with Rob McDonald. He is your business engagement partner and uh, he is here sticking by me while we work through our tech issues. So again, I apologize and I appreciate you being here today. Anyway, we are so happy to have you here with your BBB and our panel um, of local financial professionals as we honor Financial Literacy Month um, to discuss what resources are available to your small or medium sized business. The topics today will include financing, debt mitigation, and responding to this crazy economy that we're in. Before we do that, I would just like to do a land acknowledgement. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Susina, the, no the Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation, and all people who make their home in this Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. So again, thank you for joining us today. We have one hour together today, and uh, which we will start right now. Wanda Merch is our moderator, but um, and we'll take over uh, this panel discussion. And then at the time, we will have uh, time for Q&A. We will ask that if anybody has any questions during this, please put your questions in the chat box, and then we will have some time to discuss and, and have your panelists answer any questions that um, you have. But I do have the privilege today of introducing Wanda Merch. Wanda Merch began her professional journey at the University of Calgary, where she studied business and accounting. From there, she worked in the areas of taxes and audits before making the leap into consultancy. With more than 20 years as a consultant and leader of the Merch Group, Wanda recognizes that financial health is simply an indication of the strength or weaknesses of the foundation of a business elements, operations, marketing, sales, people, internal culture, and the unique elements which each company and founder has. Wanda has performed a variety of tasks with a diverse clientele with a keen interest in the creation of proactive business plans that clearly outline the steps required and the cornerstones that need to be built in order to achieve success. Wanda works with her clients throughout the implementation stage of the plan. Teaching inspiring is what gets Wanda up in the morning and we're also very pleased to say that Wanda is um, and sits on our board of directors so welcome Wanda I'm going to pass it over to you and we are so excited for you to start this panel. Thank you Maria and thank you to all of the BBB um, people who have brought this together for us today. It's such an important topic and um, as, as Maria said it's such a timely timely topic so I'm so excited today um, to introduce the panelists and we'll get we'll get right in we're going to ask a, um, a whole bunch of questions and hopefully they answer some of your more burning needs uh, we will have a Q&A but also keep in mind that if you have a specific question problem or issue feel free to reach out to the panelists and and have a one-on-one -on -one. they're very very valuable and um, information and very generous with their time so um, please make sure to do that. So, Maria, are you going to move the very good one more? Excellent. So, first up on our panel is Taz Rajan, and she is the community engagement partner with Bromwich and Smith. Taz has been in the finance industry for 18 years and has her adult educa educator certificate. Taz is passionate about simplifying complex financial concepts for Canadians and, and about getting having tough conversations started in order to find the right solution to move on and up. Uh, be this through a one on one conversation, webinars, lunch and learns, panel speaking or through the media, empowering Canadians with the right information and normalizing tough conversations is her passion. And trust me, I know Taz quite well. She's always up for a conversation. <laughs> Taz is the community engagement partner at Bromwich and, and Smith licensed insolvency trustees and has been featured on Global TV, CBC and a regular on CTV. At Bromwich and Smith, we have been helping Canadian small business Owners tackle the overwhelming burden of debt for the past 20 years through the only federally legislated debt forgiveness programs in Canada. We do find that with great compassion and focus on helping our clients to rebuild their wealth, 
their worth in all aspects. In her spare time, you can find Taz uh, facilitating personal development workshops, hiking in Canmore, volunteering, networking, and running her gift basket business, and also reading when she does a little bit of downtime. Next up, we have Riley, who is a director of commercial banking um, with the National Bank here in Alberta. Riley is born and raised Calgarian. He graduated from SAIT in Calgary, Alberta, with a major in finance and minor in accounting. During his time at SAIT, he also served as a member of the SAIT Trojans men's hockey team for four years, serving as team captain in his final season. Upon graduation, Riley began his career with ATB, and during his four years at ATB, he assumed several roles within the commercial banking sector. In November of 2019, Riley made the jump to the National Bank as Director of Commercial Banking in Alberta. In February of 2021, Riley joined the BBB, serving Alberta and East Kootenai as a Board of Directors. <coughs> as a Board of Director. In June of 2022, Riley transitioned to Vice Chair for the Board, but also, also as the Chair of Nominations and Engagement Committee. Riley is an avid fly fisherman who enjoys spending his time outdoors with his wife Robin and their two dogs, Jack and Reggie. <laughs> and then we have Tad Kruger. He is a senior account manager, small business with the BDC. Tad Kruger is a senior commercial account manager at BDC with a focus on helping businesses with their development and expansion. At BDC, they do it through advisory business, advisory service and business financing. Tad has over six years of experience in banking in Canada, including three and a half years of experience as a business account manager in one of the largest chartered banks in Canada. He has a high level of finance, financial analysis knowledge acquired through education and work experience, as well as a master's degree in finance and a bachelor's degree in business admin. Both degrees obtained at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And also, if, if you don't want to talk banking to Tad, ask him about some of his road trips and, and some, some of his adventures. He's had quite, quite an interesting um, life thus far. OK, team, we're going to dive right into this. And uh, let's get uh, the ball rolling and roll out as much information as we can in the small amount of time that we have. So I think first off, I'm going to just um, direct this question. Maybe we'll start with Taz, um, and then we'll hear from the um, other panelists. So Taz, how can your business serve Bromwich and Smith serve the needs of our accredited businesses? Thank you so much, Wanda, for having me and BBB. I'm just loving the panel. We have such a great panel today. So um, one of the biggest ways Bromwich and Smith can help accredited businesses is really by providing that unbiased and impartial information, commentary, education, and advice. If an accredited business owner is feeling even the slightest emotional and social burden of debt, their first call really should be to a licensed insolvency trustee firm like Bromwich and Smith just to seek out that write information and really be empowered to make the most informed decision based on their personal and business situation. There isn't a one size fits all. Everything is really custom tailored to the individual and to their business. So um, licensed insolvency trustees are legally bound to refer clients to the right service and option for their unique situation. And so that is really the way that I feel one of the ways that we serve the needs of our accredited businesses. Well, thank you. And how about you, Riley? And how do you, how can um, the National Bank serve um, the needs of accredited businesses? You bet. Thanks, Wanda. Our, how we can serve the accredited businesses, um, we're a bank at the end of the day. We perform every function that every other bank does. So we assist with um, all business aspects and, and the customer's needs. So from working capital to asset based financing, real estate, treasury, cash management, investments, um, it all plays a big part um, in the service that we offer. So we take that approach of providing, you know, sound and, and quality advice to our clients um, based off our, our number of years of experience and expertise. Um, but really our approach is is from, you know, 
focusing on that advice piece and, and making sure that the vice and solutions or even products that we're offering um, are tailored to that client's need. Excellent. And, and Tad, the BDC, how do they, how can they assist the accredited businesses? So BDC help, uh, helps businesses in two ways. Uh, one of them is by helping the business owners uh, um, improve their skills in terms of uh, management, uh, strategy, uh, financial management, and some other types of advisory services that we have. And then we also do lending. So uh, anywhere from uh, small working capital loans all the way to uh, multi-million dollar commercial uh, commercial um, property loans is uh, is where we do what we what we can do for for businesses. Excellent. So we have a wide variety here on the panel. And so I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Riley. Um, one of the things obviously that's um, topmost in everybody's minds these days is how do I protect my business in this inflationary environment? Very good question. And, and you know, I have this conversation or, you know, this question asked to me um, almost daily, uh, for sure, a couple times a week. But, you know, we look at these last couple of years, um, we've navigated through an uh, unprecedented time with COVID and and those challenges, um, not to say that we're, we're past it because we're still feeling those effects. So we're seeing a number of apparent obstacles in this current landscape or market, if you will. Um, like I mentioned, the aftershocks of COVID, we're seeing, you know, labor shortages, um, people and businesses are struggling to find um, stable labor. Um, we're seeing supply chain delays. We're, of course, inflation. Um, and, you know, probably most apparent at this point in time, uh, a highly volatile interest rate market. Um, so we'll dive into, you know, some of these solutions as, as we move through and, and how you can better protect yourself. But, you know, right now, that's that's on top of everybody's mind. How about you, Tad? Can you can you add anything to that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the the highly volatile interest rates is something that has that has been in um, in everybody's mind, right? How to plan the growth uh, and um, how to invest uh, in growing the business uh, in a high uh, interest rate um, environment, which we haven't seen it for at least ten years, I'd say, in Canada, right? So that is uh, that is that's the type of conversation we have. And um, what I've seen is like business owners are still interested in investing and growing their businesses despite of the high inflation or despite of the expectations of a flat economic growth for next year and um, and despite the interest rates being higher than they were in the past, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so Taz, given the volatility, like some businesses are doing really, really well, but the interest rates were so low that many people um, purchased and invested and now the interest rates are going up. Are you seeing a, an increase in solvency, insolvency um, and what other obstacles do you sort of see your clients are, are talking about in the current landscape? Yeah, you bet. So, you know, my colleagues touched on a lot of those things and it's sort of this perfect storm, right? Of, high inflation, increasing interest rates, we've got supply chain issue, issues, you've got consumer confidence issues in some ways. I know some of the stats are kind of showing, hey, consumers are doing fine, we're still spending a lot of money, but there is a bit of a, you know, a concern. Um, shortage of good employees, you know, the difficulties in scaling your business um, and then mounting personal and, you know, business debt. Um, we're also seeing like a lot of our clients um, we're sort of in between some of the different options that were available through CRA during COVID, right? So maybe they they fell through the loop. They weren't really um, SIBA and they weren't really, uh, you know, they, they didn't really fit into any of those options or they did fit, they did take something. And now, you know, CRA is knocking at your door saying, hey, we've audited this and you didn't actually qualify. And so um, there are all these different struggles that are creating the perfect storm. But I think the biggest challenge we're seeing, especially from, you know, we're such an entrepreneurial um, city here. And the big thing I see with entrepreneurs, we're independent. We're really independent folks that like to charge the hill and we don't necessarily like to ask for help. So 
what we'll often see is that these individuals, you know, these small business owners who've just waited a really long time to seek help, and we're still able to help you. But, you know, I think if people are aware of the services that are available and can maybe reach out a little bit sooner and understand that that's, that doesn't mean failure, right? I think it was Piglet asked who, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? And he said, ask for help. And it really is, that really is the bravest thing we can do, I feel, especially as entrepreneurs, because we, we're we not naturally prone to that. Good answer, thank you. Um, so Riley, let's, let's say that we understand all of our obstacles, what, what, um, what are the solutions out there? Like if, if I want to grow my business, should I um, grow it organically or can I do an acquisition? And is the bank available to help me um, if I choose either of those two paths? Yeah, and, and great question, Wanda, right? And it's, um, you know, chicken or the egg kind of scenario, right? It, when you're look, we're talking about growth of your business, it can be done in a couple of ways. You know, you're, there's two conventional ways of doing it. First, you know, being growth organically, right? So leveraging your existing operations and, and cash flow to help fund and, and support that growth, whether that be into a new market or cross border, there's a number of different ways that you can look at it. So as long as you have those stable cash flows or, you know, even a, a financial partner um, in the form of equity and or debt to help support that growth, I think it's um, definitely a good a good option. Um, organically, you know, you're going to see you're replicating your business model in your current market into, you know, a potential new market, let's say, or across province or cross border, whatever it may be. Um, so there are things to think about when doing that, right? The costs associated with it, the legislation, um, the rules, the licensing, there's a number of factors that go into it. Um, so in, the biggest thing, though, is it depends on the type of industry that you're in, right? Um, not all industries are going to be equal um, or take the same approach when growing their business into, you know, new market, let's say. Um, but there's also the, you know, solution to and more convent second conventional way of growing is, you know, acquisition. Um, so do you leverage debt and or contributing capital to acquire a company for growth? So when you're looking to do that, you need to make sure, you know, that that business, maybe it's a competitor where you're looking to capture more market share, or maybe it's a complementary business where you can capitalize on different revenue streams to your business. So when you're looking at that, you know, having a target in mind and, and going through that process, the biggest thing is, is making sure that, you know, the acquisition um, or the target that you're looking to acquire is producing cash flows to support the debt and or capital that you're going to be investing into into that growth. Um, there are programs I know with BDC, but also National Bank of Canada, where there are programs and, and debt facilities available to business owners to help achieve that growth and, and, and expand their business. Um, in Tad, Tad and I are always here to, to have those conversations and provide the most guidance um, when, when looking at this solution, because it is, it is quite intimidating. There's a lot that goes into it and, you know, it goes back to that advice piece again, um, leveraging that, those professionals to really help guide you through this because going about it alone is, can be quite daunting. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. But great points there and it kind of dovetails nicely into tad with the bdc so when when a client has decided whether they want to go acquisition organically or all those things and they what what, what should they do to prepare um tad when they come to you what is it you need from them in order to start the the conversation with the bdc so we need to understand what their growth plan is and what uh, the resources they will need uh, will be, right? Um, as um, as Riley mentioned, uh, one option is to purchase another business, right? And um, when when that is the case, normally that that other business already has has all the resources that is that it requires to to continue generating the cash flow that it uh, that it has generated in the past. Uh, but when it comes to um, uh, growing a business by opening a new location or working on more projects, let's say for a construction business, um, we need to understand what are the what are the resources that they need 
and uh, and why. Uh, so, for example, um, in a construction business, we would need to know how many how many new employees they will need. What is the working capital that will be required for um, for the new project they're going to be going to be working right? And uh, and a lot of the times is uh, what is the the timing between your um, the t- the timing between the time you pay your employees and the cost related to a project and the time you get paid from your from your clients, right? A lot of um, services businesses, all they need is working capital. Not all of they need as working capital, but the bulk of their needs when they're growing is is working capital. And so understanding that plan is uh, is the first key and the resources. And then uh, of course, um, getting the documentation in place, financial statements from the previous years, the financial statements from the businesses that they intend to acquire is important. And then uh, quotes for um, whatever other type of equipments that they need. And of course, um, one key thing, especially in their very early stages of growing a business, is the credit score, the credit history of the business owner. That is always important. It's um, what counts the most uh, towards what their interest rate is going to be in the probability of being approved or not is the personal credit credit score in the early stages of a business um, growth. So perhaps I could get us to, to um, maybe drill down a bit uh, um, with, the, with the two bankers. Um, I know BDC has a lot of checklists and some really valuable information on their website, but oftentimes, like you just said, you know, financial statements and that sort of thing. Um, what? How does the process start with the bank? Do they simply pick up the phone and call you, or do they come all prepared with their with their full file folder of all the things they think you need? And before we go. To answer that question, Tad, could you define working capital? You mentioned it a couple times, just so we're all on the same page. So working capital, the definition that I use is what is the cash that you need to operate your money, your your business, right? Um, How much cash you need to pay your employees until you get paid? Um, The accounting definition is the difference between the short term assets and the short term uh, liabilities. But I prefer to use that as amount of cash you need to operate your business. And uh, regarding the question on how the conversation gets started, um, it really depends. When when and and I'm pretty sure that would be the same with uh, with Riley as well. When we get a referral from an accountant, um, sometimes we get all the financial statements before we even meet the the business owner, and so we have a lot of information before before we meet the the, the prospect client. Uh, but in most of the cases, it starts with a conversation. It's either a, a phone call or a coffee coffee meeting to understand uh, what the business owner wants to accomplish, and then we get um, uh, we get the ball rolling in terms of what is the documents we require and how the process is going to move forward. Okay. And and to you, Riley, so, sort of same question because it is quite daunting, um, you know, to pick up the phone and call and ask for half a million dollars or whatever. So what, what how do you like to um, start the conversation? And what do you see as requirements? Well, great question. And um, Tad nailed it too with his approach. Everyone's you know, way of doing things or approach to this is, is a little bit different. But what I preach, you know, um, with a prospect, it's a little bit different because there's a you know typically an immediate need. But with an existing client, um, you know I like to be involved early and often throughout their business, um, having that insight, understanding the business, um, understanding their needs and requirements. So whether it's growth, um, you know I want to see that coming. Um, it's better to have more lead time on you know a project or you know, a transaction than than not. So that readiness and preparation is key. Um, A lot of the times, you know, the list of initial information that, you know, Tad and I will ask for is, you know, what's your business plan? What's your growth strategy and plans? We want to really make sure that the customer and or prospect has um, has thought this through, developed a, a plan, the feasibility of it, Right, because so often we get approached to, you know, I want to do this or that, and it just doesn't make sense for the business. Um, whether it's finance or even just <clears throat> um, it, going into new markets that 
that maybe necessarily necessarily aren't the bread and butter of that existing operation. Um, so really having that plan, it, our goal isn't to to drown the the prospector client in reporting, but it's really through the due diligence phase and and providing that reassurance to the bank um, that that you've thought this through. There's a plan in place and that this this transaction or whatever it may be is achievable. I, that's a great answer because one of the things I always hear is, um, you know, when you need money, the banks aren't available. But I think people need to understand that you've done your due diligence, you've gone through the plan. You've seen thousands of business plans, and if a bank turns you down, they've actually done you a favor because perhaps all your pieces aren't quite in, um, your ducks aren't in a row, if you will. So go back to the drawing board and test your assumptions a little bit better. So that was a great answer. Um, one of the other things that I kind of wanted to touch on, and then we'll circle back to Taz to finish, to, to answer this as well, but a lot of times, what is the collateral and um, personal guarantees and all those things that the banks ask uh, when when providing a loan? And then Taz, you can maybe um, at the end kind of jump in and tell us what you know what 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 the parachute position is if everything goes sideways. So we'll start with with you, Riley. What what kind of guarantees and personal guarantees and collateral do you require? On in a corporation, we're talking. For sure, and it's going to be dependent on the size of that business. Um, in turn, let's call it revenue, right? Um, let's call it top line revenue. So it's going to depend on the size and the actual transaction itself. If we're doing asset based financing, whether that's purchase of equipment and or real estate, for example, um, a lot of the you have a lot of tangible collateral in that type of transaction that the bank can secure uh, their loan against. Um, when you look at working capital, so line of credit, um, depending on the bank and again the size, so it is very dependent. Um, I just want to make sure that is clear. Typically, you know, working capital might be margin based off of, you know, percentage of your uh, Canadian receivables or and or a portion of your inventory. So that's also collateralized lending as well to some extent. Um, there, from a collection standpoint, it's easier to collateralize on a, you know, a tangible asset, real estate equipment from a resale perspective. Um, when we look at working capital position, that's then collection of AR and or selling of inventory in the event of default. So it is very tailored. Um, most times than not, there are going to be personal guarantees involved. Again, it, it, it's subject to what the actual ask is. But what I would say to the businesses on the line is that be prepared to have that conversation. Um, work with my expertise and experience working in for a couple of different banks that that's that message doesn't seem to vary or change a whole lot. Um, so it's also important, and I'm, I'm curious to hear Taz's point of view on this um, from, from her perspective when it comes to personal guarantees. Um, how we look at that, though, from a personal guarantee perspective is, you know, you're asking a bank or an institution or, you know, even an equity partner um, to invest in your business um, through the form of debt. Um, it's also important to, you know, to have that customer um, customer reciprocate it too, right? Where they're having that willingness and showing that belief in their business themselves from a, a guaranteed perspective. Do you have anything to add to that, Tad, with respect to collateral and, and personal guarantees? Yeah, when it, when we come to like uh, smaller businesses, um, the personal guarantee is um, required in all cases, and that would be the same for for all banks. Um, for working capital, it's normally 100% personal guarantee. For uh, equipment, it can be maybe 70% personal guarantee. And then when it comes to uh, commercial real estate, is a 25% personal guarantee. And the way that the banks, uh, including BDC, uh, look at that is to bridge the difference between what can be collected from selling the assets um, uh, from selling the assets to to the loan amount. So, for example, in a commercial real estate, a one million dollar uh, property, if by any chance it goes to collections, it has to be uh, uh, sold uh, uh, very fast. Let's say normally it would sell for about um, 
75% of the, the market value. And that's why the personal guarantee is, is only 25% because the bank expects to recover about 75% from selling the asset. And when it comes to working capital loans, there's no assets to be collected from, right? So that is why 100% personal guarantee is required. And that is where talking to somebody like Taz, for example, very early on when making a decision on uh, Am I going to accept this personal guarantee? And so on. The, just to just to make clear, the personal guarantee is not negotiable. It's always it's always there. But um, when planning the growth and understanding the risk that I'm, that I'm taking personally, I should talk to a lawyer and understand uh, what I'm doing with my personal guarantee. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll circle back to you, Tess. Um, same sort of question, and and um, yeah, where where are you? Where do you guys see all of this playing out? Yeah, so we, you know, it, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because many small business owners that we work with um, don't really realize that there's that personal guarantee piece there, or maybe don't fully understand it, maybe, right? They obviously haven't been talking to Tad or Riley because they've done a bang up job of explaining that. And I know that you do that when you're sitting with your clients as well. So, you know, a lot of business um, owners are putting up that personal cash or their own personal collateral and are going to do everything that they can to save their business even if it's at the expense of their own personal credit or their own personal assets right because that like that becomes our baby right so what we've seen is you know many will start liquidating certain assets certain personal assets which are actually you know if you look at the insolvency law it's a canadian law okay and there are certain there are many assets that are exempt under that insolvency law that you did not need to liquidate in order to satisfy your your creditors. So um, the other challenge we see with business owners is, you know, as a business owner, there is a need to have credit. Like it's really easy to sort of sit in our glass houses and go, well, you should just pay for everything with cash. But in real life, that, you know, that doesn't happen. You think about, you know, in your business, you've got to travel. So you need to be able to book a flight. You need to book a hotel or whatever those different things are that your business is going to need. There is going to be credit. Um, and so often we see that business owners don't want to reach out for that help for fear of losing that credit and not thinking that they're not going to be able to rebuild that credit. Um, and I, you know, in my role, my role is to normalize the conversation of debt. So it wouldn't be normalizing the conversation of debt if I didn't share with you my own personal story. And my personal story is because of some external factors, I've had to declare bankruptcy. And I've been able to rebuild credit. I have the highest credit score I've ever had in my life, like pre-bankruptcy. I have two credit cards. I have a mortgage. So I think it's really important. It, it is, it's the last resort. Bankruptcy should be the last resort. Consumer proposal is really, really powerful alternative to it. But I think fear just holds us back so often. Fear of asking for clarity. Hey, what does this mean? I'm personally guaranteeing. What, what does that mean exactly? What happens if things go sideways with my business? What happens to me personally? What happens to me business-wise, right? And then when you're slipping and you're falling and you're not sure if, you, you know, am I going to lose my personal credit to keep my business afloat? Reaching out again just for that clarity and getting that clearer picture of what are my options and what instead of assuming if I talk to somebody about my debt, I'm never going to be able to get credit again. My business is going to fail. Let's have the conversation and figure out what are your options? What are the repercussions of each option that you take? And then you make that empowered and informed decision of which way to go. Excellent answer. And then along those same lines, as a corporation, what is the shareholder not protected from? What do what um, as a shareholder director, what um, what is their liability? Yeah, so shareholders, unlike directors, are not responsible for that corporate debt unless they are the director, right? Um, it's the director of a company that may be liable for corporate CRA debt, GST, payroll, um, depending on the director's liability. Um, also, a shareholder or director would be liable if they have signed any personal guarantees on any of that corporate debt. That's how I understand it from the insolvency laws, but you know, um, maybe our esteemed colleagues here have a little bit more they could add to that. Riley? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of times you're going to see, especially in small to medium sized businesses, you're going to see that shareholder also being listed as that director, right? So um, it is important to understand and leverage the expertise of professionals when entering into any sort of agreement. 
right? You need, I highly, highly advise against signing anything without consulting the advice of your lawyer. Um, it, it is so crucial to understand, but also to have these conversations because a lot of the time these conversations are avoided, right? We're talking worst case scenario, we're talking repercussions, we're talking default. Um, and I think it should be had more often than it is because you need to understand the consequences and what you're agreeing into, right? Um, so I, I'm, I'm really glad that we are having this. Um, I think it is very valuable to to speak about this openly. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think Taz, you brought up a good point about like, um, you know, people wanting to pay cash for everything. And I always equate that to um, if you had to pay cash for your house, how long would it take you to get into a home ownership? So debt if used properly is a you know catapults you to the next level as as riley was talking about through organic growth or acquisition or those sorts of things so just before we turn it over to the q a and hopefully we have some really good uh, conversation there we've kind of been it kind of spiraled into a bit of a dismal place you know um personal personal guarantees and debt and all that sort of thing. So let's turn it around. We talked about the obstacles of um, the current economics. Where do the three of you see um, growth opportunities and um, some really interesting things happening? Um, you know, internationally, I know we've struggled with the supply chain, but where, you know, where that one falls apart, there's other opportunities and those sorts of things. So, Ted, I'll put you on the spot. What, where do you see some optimism and some excitement and um, that sort of thing? So, I work with uh, different industries, right? Uh, the diversified portfolio. Um, I haven't seen many people going into collections, which is very, very good, right? Even at the former bank where I worked, um, had over 20, uh, 250 clients, never had to send any one of them to collections, right? So that means most of the business owners that uh, jump into, into starting a business or growing a business, they, they succeed. Um, and then in this, this market uh, uh, place where we are now, um, I, I, the, the way that I see it is those that believe that they can find opportunities even when there's no economic growth, they do and they, and they succeed. So um industries that i've seen growing like uh, businesses in construction um liquor stores a lot of uh, a lot of um new new liquor stores happening uh coffee shops um what else um other businesses in the service industry uh, a lot of uh, the the service industry businesses are doing well as well so i think i think there's opportunity for those who have the right skills and the right plan in place and of course, uh, as we mentioned before, an opportunity is um, buying a business, right? We know that, um, like the statistics say, I think that over 50% of the businesses will be sold in the next five to 10 years because of uh, the baby boomers going into retirement. And so that is a huge opportunity for, for anyone who is who already has a business or wants to become a business owner in the future. Oh, that's a great, that's a very good point. Yeah. How about you, Riley? Where do you see some optimism and um, good news? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. We're starting to see those industries from that, you know, let's call it suffered the, the most or felt the, the biggest effects of COVID start to rebound. So uh, tourism, hospitality, retail, all those are, are seeing an uptick um, just with, you know, everyone being back, everything being back open. You, you look around downtown, even driving into the core today, you're starting to see that volume and, and really having that vibrant, uh, that vibrant environment back, mm -hmm. which is so good to see. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, opportunity right now, um, and it, and it kind of goes back to the inflationary environment. Like what my biggest, my biggest, takeaway that I want everyone to take um, take from today is we've seen the cost of doing business increasing exponentially. So how do we protect ourselves? How do we grow? How do we manage a business in this environment? Um, first off, it, it 
it's about understanding your business. And when, when I say understanding, I'm speaking of the financial understanding. It's, it's so important and I can't preach this enough to have strong and prudent financial controls in place. Um, and what I mean is, you know, comprehending your balance sheet and measuring the key financial ratios of, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, networking, networking capital, quick and current ratios and debt to equity. Really having that understanding of a business leader is going to set you apart. Um, but also having a healthy balance sheet is, is key to a strong, stable and resilient business, especially through this inflationary environment. Um, you know, things aren't getting cheaper and that's just the reality of it. So no matter what industry that you are in, you're going to see an increased cost to your cost of goods, to the most of your expenses and your general and administrative um, parts of your business. So please ensure that you are maintaining your profitability ratios, especially your gross margin ratio. Um, by understanding these checks and balances, you know, and the, you know, the increase to your inputs or your cross or goods sold, um, you need to also increase your pricing because at the end of the day, and I found this to be such a sensitive topic of, of discussion as of late, um, but at the end of the day, you're in the business of business and you know businesses are meant to, to make money and be profitable because at the end of the day as well, it's you and your family that this business is supporting. So if you can really demonstrate this and have those fine um, controls and, and knowing what they mean and improving it, you're just going to be better set uh, moving forward and really have that resiliency. I, I love that you're speaking to the choir. I mean, most people can read their income statement P&L, but most entrepreneurs kind of put blinders on when it comes to that balance sheet, but the power is in the balance sheet really understanding the balance sheet and i love all the the um yeah so if you're feeling a little bamboozled about all those um ratios and whatnot it behooves you to really go and find out what they are and how they relate to your business so if we could start opening up for the q a just as i round out uh, sort of closing comments i'd love for anyone to ask questions in the chat um, if it's a specific or a general question, like specific to the panelist or general that you want all of them to touch on, let us know what it is that um, you really want to know. You have um, bankers and, and a, a trustees here, so ask away and um, love to sort of have some really good meaty conversations because we're here for you and we've got 13 more minutes. So just as a wind up. Um, Taz, did, is there anything else you kind of wanted to add as we wait for some of the questions to come in? Some closing comments, if you will. Sure. I, I just I, I want to commend the BBB for, you know, I know Riley said it earlier, but just for starting to have this conversation um, and I just, you know, closing comment for me or in terms of like, what are the opportunities? The opportunities are this. Let's start talking more. Um, if you've got a question or you're struggling with something, it's, you know, the power of, you know, five or 10 times you, right? So you are not alone. And I, I know from personal experience, you absolutely feel like everyone else has it together. All these other businesses are doing great. I'm the idiot or I'm the only one who's failing, but that's not true. Let's normalize that and let's start talking about these things, asking these questions, you know, ideally we're being proactive and we're, you know, getting some advice and looking at all of these things ahead of time, but it's not too late. If you're in the thick of it right now, let's start having these conversations, talk to the right experts. Yes, there's tons of different banks out there, but these two bankers specialize in business banking. So get those nitty gritty questions out there. Let's get rid of our fear of talking to maybe a business lawyer or a franchise lawyer, as you know, you guys were suggesting, like you don't want someone to be signing these documents without speaking to their lawyer. Have a look at, hey, like as a as a business owner, you're 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 thinking quite far ahead. So hey, what if things did go sideways? What if I'm really overwhelmed with my debt? Maybe I should sit down and talk to a licensed insolvency trustee and just pick their brains around planning for this not to happen. Going to do everything I can that this does not happen. If it does happen, though, what does it look like? What does it look like for me personally? What does it look like for me as my business? 
what are my options? How do I mitigate it? How do I, you know, reduce the impact that it's going to have? I, I think this is where a lot of that opportunity is, is to start getting that financial literacy and having the questions and then taking the right action. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Tad, do you have um, any sort of, do you have, you want to put a big bow on this? Do you have anything else to add? I think uh, the basic of business is building a business model that is profitable uh, before we want to to grow too fast. Like uh, you have to 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 get that uh, smaller location to be profitable before you can uh, manage a larger location, for example. And so, like, is really looking for a business model that that can generate a pos uh, positive uh, um, profitability is is the key, I think. Yeah, and and in the no, in the um, chat, Martin has mentioned he was he's in the tourism business, and COVID, as we know, hit hard. And um, fortunately, the BDC came through for him, and it's a it's a great business. Um, sorry, Martin, I'm drawing a blank as to the name of your company, but if you if you ever want to hit a train, go on a train tour. Martin's your guy. So, Riley, how about you? Do you have anything to to um, put a bow on this? Do you, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I could talk about this all day. Um, I think it's so important having these conversations. And and Martin, thank you for sharing that. Um, and it, it's so often that we see this, you know, circumstances. And I think you had had mentioned it, Wanda, but you know, how having access to capital or debt, let's call it, um, and not needing it is, you know, best practice for needing it and not having it. Um, and what I really try and preach is, you know, you have your business, but there's also the team that surrounds your business. Um, I will tell people this in, in pretty much every conversation I have is that you, there are three professionals that are vital to your business in no particular order. Number one, your accountant, number two, your banker, and number three, your lawyer. You really need to leverage them and, and keep those communication channels open between the three of them so that they can help better serve you and understand which, which you may need. Um, but that that was that would be what I would say to kind of wrap up that piece of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like and I like that um, the tr the team idea. And I think the other thing that's interesting is the three of you are out at the BDs at the um, BBB networking events all the time. So you're very approachable. So um, if you know, I would encourage you guys to come out to BBB events, shake hands with these. Taz is everywhere, but <laughs> but they're always available and they're very approachable. And um, Charla just wants to say she's she's apparently ranking accountants above the bankers because she says they're worth their weight in gold. So uh, absolutely, um, yeah, both both accountants from a, a internal perspective and your tax people. Once you start making your money then then um, it's important to get some really good tax advice as well. We, we just didn't have enough room on the panel to fit all the experts in that you need. Um, yeah, and the, the business valuators, I think, is another one that uh, is another part of the team, maybe the B team, if you are thinking of acquiring something. But again, um, the, the panels, panelists have read so many um, business plans and valuation documents and that sort of thing so they can always steer you in the right direction if indeed you do need a much better um, valuation on what you're buying or selling. Um, I know the BDC has a program where they'll help your employees uh, buy your firm if um, if that's an option that you want to take. Riley, do you have a program like that as well where you'll help employees purchase um, the firm yeah, yeah yeah it's called our business transfer program and th this is you know probably a great area for synergy between uh tad and i is that you know when i say business transfer i also mean like cash flow lending too so we look at you know employees purchasing a business or a management buyout of sorts we do have quite a quite a strong program when it comes to that um, because at the end of the day the biggest risk in that transaction is the transition risk right we're gonna we're now starting to see ownership change hands and 
also like Tad mentioned, it's coming. It, it's coming more often with, with baby boomers reaching retirement. Um, we're going to see ownership changing hands um, quite frequently here over this next five years, but also from a succession standpoint too of that business owner, right? All of a sudden you're selling your business. So understanding what it's worth, um, the tax implications that come with it, structuring it in a way that's more, most tax efficient for you is, is vital, whether it's share or asset purchase. This is a, just a prime example of why you need these professionals surrounding you and, and your business, um, because there's so many variables that go in play. And, um, you know, from a true entrepreneur uh, standpoint or perspective, you know, a lot of a lot of those entrepreneurs are on the tools, are going to see customers, are performing the work themselves. And there's only so many hours in the day where you really need to get that assistance and advice from from those who who can really help. Perfect. And and Tad, so you do do you do a lot of um, employee purchases where one or two key employees are going to buy out the owner as he's uh, he or she is getting ready to retire? Oh. I'm working on a file of similar to that uh, at this moment. Um, I've done a lot of uh, changes in ownership in which somebody else bought the business. And uh, in that case, uh, the industry experience of the buyers is uh, the key for the success of the business. Uh, but uh, we do like when uh, when the, the management uh, stays, uh, somebody who knows the business and so on. So yeah, definitely a, a deal we, we, we do more often than not. Excellent. So Josh wants to know about uh, BBB networking um, events. So I think we'll leave that for the BBB people to answer where they yeah. can find the calendar. And it doesn't seem that we have very many other questions here. So did we want to turn it back to Maria for closing comments? Sure. Well, wow, this was great. What a great array of comments and suggestions and advice. That's really great. I'll answer Josh. There's um, a couple different ways to find out about um, BBB networking events. And if you go to uh, your BBB.org internet uh, to our website, up in the right hand corner, you'll see events on there. You can click on that and it will give you um, uh, the options for what events are coming up. Secondly, they are included in our newsletter that we send out monthly. And then also when we have events on the roster, then we do once a month send out an event e-blast to all of our accredited businesses to let them know what's happening and, and, and how to sign up. So that would be kind of the three ways on how you do that and how you find out about our networking events. Yes, and our, yes, of course, that's great, Rob. Thank you. And also check our social media. We're always posting about upcoming events and sharing events with our partners, such as National Bank and BDC and Bromwich and Smith and anything else that's happening. But we do have a community page as well for accredited businesses. And you are free if you are a member of that community Facebook group to um, also share your own events as well as we share ours on there. So thank you for asking that question. Can I just say that, wow, you know, I heard a lot of things today I heard like you know a lot of preparation you know when it comes to understanding time frames and your growth plans um, understanding your cash flow and your balance sheets you know always consult a lawyer which is really um, important and then get involved early and often uh, when it comes to dealing with any of your you know financial needs or or, or wanting your growth plans or, or looking for assistance but the number one thing I heard was you know ask for help and I think that, you know, that is key. And I think, Taz, you mentioned that. But in all three of our panelists, I mean, that was key. When you're looking for help, regardless of whether you're growing or starting your business or needing help on the other end, always ask for help. But I, and, and Taz, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing your story with us as well, because you're right. We're all in these situations at one point or another with our economy and COVID and all those things. So anyway, thank you for that. And, um, and yes, always reach out to your BBB as well if you're looking for help. The biggest thing, obviously, you know that we do is bringing consumers and businesses together to promote that trustworthy marketplace and always dealing with 
um, trustworthy businesses like um, the individuals on our panels today. So, you know, a big thank you uh, from the BBB for for sharing your knowledge and information. We will and we have recorded this, so we will send it out to um, everyone that's been attended as well as uh, put it on our YouTube channel as well so that people can have access to this as well. And I'm sure our panelists will be sharing the information as well. So a huge thank you. Wanda, thank you for being the best today and, and, and really leading this conversation to where, you know, I think our businesses can get a lot of value from, you know, who to use, where to go and when. And again, I can't say this enough, ask for help. So thank you very much.